Welcome everyone to this uh, free webinar. Today, inshallah, we are going to talk about uh, the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, one of the uh, complications of fertility treatment, one of the complications of uh, induction of ovulation, one of the important topics we need to uh, know more about and to know how to manage uh, such conditions if we are going to deal with a uh, uh, an infertile woman, and we are going to give her induction of ovulation. Of course, we have to know that there is one of the serious complications after ovulation induction, which is the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So we need to know how to diagnose the condition, how to uh, manage it, okay? So um, this uh, topic is... Uh, as I told you, is a very important clinical topic we need to know. And as now in part one uh, MRCG exams, um, there is a new policy to increase the number of clinical questions. So it's important to know uh, some of uh, the green top guidelines, of course, in a summarized way, uh, which would be suitable to the level of part one MRCG exam. So <clears throat> this uh, topic is from the Green Top Guidelines number five, which was published in February uh, 2016. Uh, and um, there is no updates uh, uh, since this version. So we are going to uh, um, summarize what are the important points in this Green Top Guide. Before we start talking specifically about the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, we need to do some brainstorming. And here I'm going to talk about the endocrinology. I'm going to talk about the hormonal control of the process of ovulation, of course, in a, uh, in a summarized way, quickly. And let's give a hint about the induction of ovulation and to understand what's meant by the ovulation induction protocols and then this will give us an idea about the pathophysiology of the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So I'm going to move um, uh, to the whiteboard. And uh, uh, let me first explain things about the physiology. Can you see the whiteboard now? Okay, very good. So, to know more about the physiology, of course, we have the uh, uh, hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus produce the gonadotropin releasing hormone. And look here, this release is in a pulsatile manner. And this is the first thing I want to comment on later on about the induction of ovulation protocols, okay? But first, put in your mind that the GnRH is coming from the hypothalamus in a pulsatile manner, and this is very important. Of course, the GnRH will stimulate the anterior pituitary gland to produce the FSH and LH hormones, and of course, the FSH and LH hormones will take control of the changes in the ovary regarding the process of ovulation. Of course, throughout the ovarian cycle, the ovary produce three main hormones. These hormones are the estrogen and inhipine hormone. And this is from the granulosa cells, the granulosa cells of the ovary, and also after ovulation, the corpus luteum start to produce the progesterone hormone. So if we look at this picture here, we have two cells in the ovary, the theca cells and the granulosa cells. The LH hormone stimulates the theca cells to produce androgens. Of course, all the steroid hormones 
come from single precursor hormone, the father or the godfather of all these steroid hormones, which is the cholesterol. So the LH hormone will stimulate the theca cells to convert the cholesterol until producing the androstenedione hormone. One of the androgens, of course, which will diffuse to the granulosa cells and by the help of the aromatase enzyme and by the stimulation of the FSH hormone, the androgens or the androstenedione will be converted into estradiol or estrogen antient. Once the estrogen is produced from the granulosa cells and along with the inhipine hormone, it causes what, what we call the negative feedback to suppress the pituitary gonadotropines, the FSH and LH. And when the look at this graph here, this is the ovarian cycle. As we can see at the start of the cycle, the hormone in the blue color, the FSH, start to stimulate the process of the final uh, uh, growth stage of the, of the uh, ovarian follicle or the gradient follicle. And the more the follicle grow, the more estrogen is released from the follicle and this causes inhibition of the FSH hormone. But once the estrogen hormone reach a certain level, which is more than 300 picograms, it produces a positive feedback on the anterior pituitary gland to make what we call the LH surge, the LH surge, or the sudden increase in the LH hormone, which will trigger the ovulation, trigger the rupture of the gradient follicle and the extraction of the oocyte from inside this follicle. And now the follicle becomes what we call the corpus luteum, and the lifespan of the corpus luteum is 14 days. If pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum will die after 14 days. So the level of all the hormones, mainly the estrogen and progesterone, will fall. This will lead to shedding of the endometrium and the release of the anterior pituitary from the negative feedback. So the FSH rise again and a new cycle begins. So this is quickly what happens in the ovarian cycle. Okay, so to come in conclusion here, the main hormone which stimulate the final stages of the ovarian follicle growth or maturation is of course the FSH hormone. So to think about induction of ovulation, I mean that a woman, an infertile woman who is having a problem in the ovulation. So the key to induce her ovary to start ovulating is by means of increasing this fundamental important hormone, which is the FSH. And this can occur by two methods, a direct one and indirect one. So what is the direct one? Simply give her FSH injections, give her the FSH hormone as uh, uh, injections, or I mean purified form or with uh, LH in one uh, um, combination, I mean. So if you give her FSH, whether purified alone, I mean, or in combination with LH, this will stimulate the follicle to grow. So this is a direct method. But there is another one which will be an indirect method, indirect method. If there are any means to decrease the estrogen level in the body so that the anterior pituitary try to compensate of this decline in the estrogen level, it will, of course, increase its endogenous FSH. So when the body feels that there is low levels of estrogen, it will try to compensate for that by increasing the endogenous FSH. And this is can be done by two ways. Whether to block the estrogen receptors in the central nervous system, 
in the pituitary gland. So the pituitary will feel that the estrogen levels are low. So it will increase the endogenous FSH. This is like by drugs, we know that like the clomiphene citrate, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, clomiphene citrate or the clomide, okay? Or by another way, which is inhibition of the estrogen synthesis. And we know that the main enzyme uh, involved in estrogen synthesis is the aromatase enzyme. So if we have a drug like aromatase inhibitor, it will decrease the estrogen synthesis. So the body will try to compensate for that by increasing the endogenous FSH. So this will stimulate the ovulation, like the, the letrozole drug, which is an aromatase inhibitor. So, that, so this is the mechanism by which the drugs act in induction of ovulation. Whether to give like the gonadotropines <clears throat> exogenously in uh, uh, like we have purified forms of FSH alone and we have combinations between FSH and LH. We call that these the human menopausal gonadotropines because it's prepared from the urine of the menopausal females containing FSH and LH or by indirectly by declining the estrogen level in uh, the body by blocking the estrogen receptors by the serms like the clomiphene citrate or by inhibiting the estrogen synthesis by the aromatase enzyme. Am I clear so far, everyone? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. So let's go back to the first point I wanted to comment on the release of the GnRH in a pulsatile manner. And this is important to make the pituitary gland function well and produce FSH and LH. And I usually like uh, tell a story in this uh, issue to understand what or how the GnRH analogs work in such situations when we give induction protocols, especially when we, when we do controlled ovarian stimulation in for patients going for IVF. In this situation, for those women undergoing IVF treatment, we do controlled ovarian stimulation by high doses of gonadotropines so that we have multiple follicular growth, like from eight, to 15 follicle, we need, this is our aim, eight to 15 follicle. Then under ultrasound guidance, we are going to aspirate these oocytes, which we call the ovum pickup. And in the laboratory, we are going to fertilize these oocytes by the male sperms to have embryos. And then these embryos will be transferred to the uterus later on, okay? So this is what we do in controlled ovarian stimulation for women undergoing IVF or ICSI, okay? So here, our aim is to have multiple follicular growth. So it comes to, or as a problem, facing people who started thinking about this controlled ovarian stimulation, that we need to aspirate these oocytes in the laboratory, right? But we cannot make sure or guarantee that the time of the endogenous LH surge coming from the pituitary will be at the same time we need to aspirate the oocytes. I mean that when the follicles start to grow, many numbers, and we have excessive estrogen in the body, this can trigger the endogenous LH surge, and the pituitary can stimulate the rupture of the follicles, okay? And all the, these follicles might be lost in the peritoneum before we can aspirate them in the laboratory or under, under ultrasound guidance, right? So the scientists thought about, we have to shut down the pituitary gland. We have to, to make sure that the pituitary gland is also shut down so that we can take control of everything. We control the growth of the follicles and also we control the time of the LH surge 
so that we can pick up the oocytes under ultrasound guidance and start to fertilize them. So the GnRH, the natural GnRH, is containing 10 amino acids. Then the two scientists tried to you know, uh, rearrange the sequence of amino acids uh, uh, in the, the, GR, the natural GnRH. So they end by uh, inventing two analogs. One we call the GnRH agonist. And the next one, or the second one, is the GnRH antagonist. Of course, if we look at the antagonist from its name, it blocks the GnRH receptors on the pituitary gland. So it will suppress the pituitary. But when we talk about the GnRH agonist, to the first instance, when, we, when, when you think that the GnRH agonist is agonist, so it will stimulate the pituitary gland, not inhibit. But yes, it will stimulate the pituitary gland if the pituitary gland is exposed to the GnRH agonist for the first time, and if you give it impulses, like the natural form. But if you give the GnRH agonist in a continuous way, okay, after some time, this will cause what we call down regulation of the pituitary gland and suppression of the pituitary gland. And I can, you know, mimic this by uh, like a, a funny story. If you have, if you are working, or if you have a bunch of people, okay, working in a company, okay, and their boss, okay, give them tasks, you know, every couple of days. They ask them to do something in their work every two or three days. So the employees are happy because they have the time to work, okay, and to finish the task, and then they can, you know, receive another task and so on. But if this boss becomes, you know, uh, so aggressive and he gives them tasks every day, every day, every day a task, the employees at the, at, at the first instance, they will try to respond, they, they will try to finish their tasks, okay? So there will be like a respond, they will start to finish their task, but after some time, they will start to get tired, exhausted. So they'll start to leave their job, okay? So after some time, the work will be stopped, halted. This is the same, you know, idea. If I'm going to give the pituitary gland instructions for impulses, it will respond, okay? But if you give the pituitary gland continuous instructions by the GnRH agonist, this, the receptors will start to be down-regulated. The number of receptors will be minimized. And after some time, the pituitary gland will be completely suppressed. So if you use the GnRH agonist for long time in a continuous way, this will cause also suppression of the pituitary gland. Am I clear, everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. So if we look at this graph here, this is like the, the GnRH agonist protocol here, when we talk about the protocols used for controlled ovarian stimulation for IVF. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not talking here about the mild induction when we do that for a, a woman having PCOs, uh, polycystic ovary, for example. I'm giving her very small doses of clomiphene citrate or letrozole to induce a monofollicular growth, one follicle only. No, I'm here talking about those females undergoing IVF. So I'm, I'm doing massive stimulation, controlled stimulation to have many oocytes, many embryos at the end, okay? So as you can see in this graph, you, we usually use the GnRH agonist. This is a standard protocol. Two weeks before the uh, uh, cycle we need to induce, okay? Then from the second day of the uh, uh, next cycle, we start to give the gonadal tropines like the FSH or FSH and LH. And once the follicle grow to the desired size, like 16 to 18 millimeter, we trigger the ovulation. We trigger the ovulation. And we have here two methods to trigger, one method only to trigger the ovulation. 
is to give the HCG, the human chorionic gonadotropin. So why we give human chorionic gonadotropin? Why do we do not give LH? Why we do not have exogenous LH to give it as a, stimu as a stimulation or a trigger for ovulation? Because they found that the HCG has, you know, uh, is more stable than the LH, can be purified, okay, and has longer half-life. And when you get HCG, it works as the LH hormone. We know that all the glycoproteins, the FSH, LH, TSH, and HCG, we are we call them all our glycoproteins, they are similar in structure. They have alpha and beta succinates, all of them. The alpha succinate is similar in all these hormones. So the HCG can do the same work of LH hormone. So the HCG will trigger the ovulation, and also it will support the corpus luteum. So this is the aim of, and of triggering the ovulation by the HCG here when we are using the GNRH agonist protocol. And as, I, as you can see in, in this graph, we use it like two weeks before starting giving the gonadotropines because we need some time until it works and until the pituitary is completely suppressed, okay? But if you look at the, the, this graph, which is about the antagonist protocol, the good thing about the antagonist protocol is that it works immediately. Like from the first or the second day at the maximum when it's given, it works and it blocks the pituitary gland receptors and shut down the pituitary gland. So there is no need to give it for a long time. So we wait until the follicle reach 14 millimeter in size, so we are approaching the mature size of the follicle, then we start to give the antagonist uh, uh, injections to block the pituitary gland, and then we can trigger the ovulation. And here we can, or we have two options for triggering the ovulation, either to give HCG as the agonist protocol, or we can give what we call the agonist trigger. What is meant by agonist trigger here? It means that I'm using the antagonist to block the receptors, right? And we shut down the pituitary gland. And once the follicle reach the mature size of 16 to 18 millimeter, I stop the antagonist completely. Now the receptors are open and I give an injection, one injection of GNRH agonist. And as, as I told you, the pituitary gland usually respond to the first time it's exposed to GNRH agonist by responding, right? So it will, this will release endogenous LH and cause the LH surge and cause triggering of ovulation. So when we use the GNRH antagonist protocol, we have two methods of triggering the ovulation, to give the HCG or to give the GNRH agonist. Clear everyone? Okay, so this was quickly the physiology of the ovarian cycle and the idea about the uh, uh, induction of ovulation, <clears throat> especially when we talk about the um, protocols of, for IVF or controlled ovarian stimulation protocols for IVF or ICSI when we need multi follicular growth. Now, let's go back to uh, uh, our presentation. And let's move now to the main topic we need to discuss today, which is the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So what's meant by the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome? It's a complication of fertility treatment. And when we use pharmacological ovarian stimulation to increase the number of oocytes, and therefore, the embryos available during ART or assisted reproductive techniques, some women undergoes excessive response. This is an excessive response which is or exceeds that aimed for. It's more than the desired response. So if I'm aiming like to get like eight to 10 or eight to 15 maximum oocytes, 
<clears throat> now I have 20, uh, 25, 30, and we have seen cases up to 40 and 50 follicles in her ovaries, okay? So this, so this is a massive response, of course. Of course, this might look as it's good. We have a lot of oocytes, so we have a lot of embryos for her to get pregnant. So it, it will increase the chance of her for her to get pregnant. Yes, but this is for the pregnancy outcome. But medically and for her, for her health, of course, it's not a good thing because OHSS is a, a problem which might be severe or critical that even needs admission to the intensive care unit. So what is the pathophysiology behind this problem or this condition? This is the main problem. The exposure of the stimulated ovaries to the HCG trigger is the main cause behind the pathophysiology of the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, okay? Because the, ex the exposure of the stimulated ovaries to HCG will trigger the release of many inflammatory mediators. One of these mediators, and we can say the chief one or the most important one, is the vascular endothelial growth factor. And the occurrence of this ovarian enlargement, because now the ovary contains multiple follicles, okay, with the local and systemic effects of these inflammatory mediators, especially the vascular endothelial growth factor, is behind or responsible for the clinical features of this OHSS because the inflammatory mediators, the vascular endothelial growth factors, and, and the other inflammatory mediators, it also include like other interleukins and so on, will increase the vascular permeability and also increase the prothrombotic effect, increase the incidence of venous thromboembolism accidents in this female. So these are the main clinical features of the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Look at this graph here. When there is a release of the vaso vasoactive factors, this will increase the uh, leakage from the blood vessels or from the capillary. This will lead to leakage of fluid in the interstitial space or in the interstitial tissue causing tissue edema and also diffusion of the fluid in the uh, third spaces like causing ascites, pleural effusion, precardial effusion. Of course, this is in severe cases. The leakage of fluid from inside the blood will cause hypovolemia, will cause hypovolemia and the hypovolemia will end by increasing the hypercoagulability due to heme concentration, increasing the concentration of the blood cells, so it will lead to hypercoagulability and thrombotic events, and also decreased organ perfusion. This will cause liver and renal impairment. So this is the manifestations or the main pathological changes occurring in the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. The incidence, of course, or the true incidence of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is not accurate because most of the mild and moderate cases are not reported. It's only mandatory to report the severe and critical cases. But generally speaking, in cycles of conventional IVF, mild OHS, uh, mild OHSS <clears throat> has been estimated to affect about one third of the cycle. So in in, in, in conventional IVF cycles, one third of the females might experience mild forms of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which usually resolve spontaneously without any uh, uh, problems. But the combined incidence of moderate to severe OHSS is varying from 3.1% uh, to 8%, and the incidence of hospitalization due to OHSS is about 0.3%. So this is the incidence or the magnitude of our problem here. Am I clear so far, everyone? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. So what are the risk factors behind this condition? Okay. 
course, the, the more ovarian reserve, the more follicles within the ovary, the more the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So assume that a woman is having high reserve. She has polycystic ovary syndrome. She has high anti-mullerian hormone. She has high antral follicle count. So the more the reserve, the more the follicles inside the ovary, of course, the more the response, the more the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Also, a previous history of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome means that the woman is still at risk of another episode of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome with another cycle of stimulation. The cycles where GnRH agonists are used and the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation is less the, uh, when we use the GnRH antagonist. Why? Can anyone tell me why? Why when we use the GnRH agonist, the risk is more than when we use the antagonist protocol? There is one simple reason we have discussed in the physiology or the, in the induction of ovulation part. Can anyone volunteer and tell me? No one will tell me, okay. So why simply, as I told you in the antagonist protocol, we have two options of triggering of the ovulation. And now in our practice, when we use the GnRH antagonist protocol, we usually, <clears throat> or we, most of the cases give the trigger by the GnRH agonist, not by the HCG. So in, when we use the GnRH antagonist protocol, we have two ways of triggering the ovulation, either to use HCG or GnRH agonist. And as we know that the HCG is the main reason behind OHSS, so we use the GnRH agonist trigger, okay? But in the agonist protocol, we don't have any other way to trigger the ovulation except by HCG. So that's why the risk of OHSS with the GnRH agonist protocol is more than the antagonist protocol. Clear, everyone? Is it Sir, clear? can you please repeat this point? Okay. Let's go back to this figure here. Okay. We know that the HCG, as I, I told you from the pathophysiology, the HCG is the, main, is the main reason behind the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Okay. This is the GnRH antagonist protocol. When we, when we plug the receptors of the pituitary by the GnRH, antagonist protocol and when the follicle reach the desired size between 16 and 18 millimeter and we need to trigger the ovulation here we have two choices right either to give the hcg which is the basic thing we know or we have another method to give gnrh agonist single shot of gnrh agonist because a single shot of gnrh agonist will stimulate the endogenous lh of the pituitary to trigger the ovulation. This can be done in the antagonist protocol only. But if you are already blocking the pituitary gland by the GnRH agonist protocol, you are giving GnRH agonist for so long time and the pituitary is suppressed, then you have only one option to trigger the ovulation, which is giving HCG because there is no meaning for giving here another shot of GnRH agonist because the pituitary is already closed or shut down by a long period of GnRH agonist. So if you trigger the ovulation by GnRH agonist, you are not doing anything. You are blocking the pituitary more and more because it's already down-regulated, right? But here we have only one option, which is HCG. And as HCG is the main reason behind OHSS, so with the GnRH agonist protocol, the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation will be more than the antagonist protocol where we have two options. And now in the modern practice, we usually 
when we use the antagonist protocol, we usually give we give we give GnRH agonist trigger to avoid the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Exactly, Dr. Alishpa. Yes, that's because in agonist protocol, we only trigger with HCG, and that's the main cause. <clears throat> that's why the risk is more than in the agonist protocol. Very good. Also, cycles where conception or pregnancy occurs and cycles resulting in multiple pregnancy. Why? Who will tell me why? Why in pregnancy? the risk would be more, and why in multiple pregnancy the risk would be more? More HCG is elaborated. Exactly, now we have not only the exogenous HCG we have given, but now we have endogenous HCG coming from the pregnancy. And in multiple pregnancy, the level of HCG is more, so the problem will be more prominent. That's what we call late OHSS, I'm going to describe the, the types of OHSS we have early and late. The late one, which occurs with pregnancy because of the endogenous H, uh, HCG coming from the sensitive trophoblast, this will lead to uh, uh, increase the risk of OHSS. Also from the risk factors, the young age, because with young age, the reserve is more because older women has uh, uh, little reserve compared with uh, to, or to younger women. And also the low PMI, because in the low PMI, uh, the, the, the little amount of fat will, you know, uh, make more of the drug to be, uh, or the, uh, the exposure of the ovary here, and the, like, um, uh, what we say, the, um, uh, the amount of the drug to be reaching the ovary will be more than those having a lot of fat, deposited fat, so the, the risk was, is more with low PMI than uh, obese, obese women, okay? So these are all risk factors of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Okay, so uh, how to diagnose the condition? Of course, it's very important. If you are suspecting that your patient is having ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, that you do a face-to-face -face clinical assessment. It's not enough to have a phone call and to diagnose it. You know, you have to examine the female and uh, do some investigations to confirm the diagnosis. And of course, if you are seeing this patient for the first time, you have to take a thorough history, like the time of onset of symptoms, what were uh, the doses of gonadotropines she was given, uh, how was the trigger of ovulation, whether she was taking a GnRH agonist or antagonist protocol, and whether she was uh, triggered by agonist or by HCG, how many numbers uh, what are the number of eggs collected? What are the numbers of embryos replaced if she had fresh embryo transfer and the embryos were retransferred again to the uterus? If she has a history uh, of uh, polycystic ovary syndrome? So these are very important questions to ask when you take a history from a patient uh, uh, suspected to have ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. The woman having ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome might suffer symptoms like abdominal bloating, discomfort, nausea and vomiting, breathlessness, especially if there is ascites. Uh, the uh, organ hypoperfusion might uh, reduce the urine output. This is also very important uh, uh, symptom and sign to uh, investigate very well. Edema, of course, whether leg swelling or vulval edema, and uh, there might be complicated uh, conditions associated comorbidities like thrombosis, and this is also a very risky issue. You have to assess her generally uh, looking for the dehydration, signs of dehydration, edema. Uh, you have to check the vital signs. You have to check the abdomen for ascites, any signs of uh, acute abdominal pain or peritonism because these are not common with uh, the, 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 like the regular cases or the standard cases of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is not associated with acute pain or signs of peritonism. If you find symptoms like this or signs like this, you have to uh, uh, check for other uh, uh, diagnoses. Like there might be ovarian torsion, there might be like ovarian rupture or something like that. So you have to check this very well. You have to check the respiratory 
the respiratory system, the respiration, to assess if there is any signs of pleural effusion, pulmonary edema, or even pulmonary embolism. So these are uh, um, things you have to examine very well. So we have many uh, clinical signs and symptoms, headache, ascites, dizziness, abdominal pain, uh, abnormal liver and kidney function, uh, thrombotic uh, process, pulmonary complications, electrolyte imbalance. So I'm going to check these in investigations as well. As I told you, it's not common to see severe pain, pyrexia, or signs of peritonism in standard cases of OHSS. So if you have these symptoms, you have to, uh, or these features, you have to make a thorough clinical review and uh, in other investigations to rule out other diagnosis. Of course, from the complications of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, there might be renal failure in severe cases, acute respiratory distress syndrome, hemorrhage from ovarian rupture and thromboembolism. So these are the complications and the differential diagnosis might be pelvic infection, abscess, appendicitis, ovarian torsion, set structure, coal perforation. And this can occur, by the way, uh, when you uh, try to aspirate the oocyte under ultrasound guidance by the needle sometimes, or if you are not uh, uh, trained very well, if you are not expert, you might injure blood vessel, you might injure an organ. So uh, this can be also a matter of differential diagnosis. Also, if pregnancy occurs, there might be ectopic pregnancy, and ectopic pregnancy also can occur in IVF or ICSI. So also this might be in our differential diagnosis. So what the investigations or what investigations to be done in a case of OHSS. There are standard investigations we have to do for any case of OHSS. You have to check the uh, full blood count and especially the hematocrit value to check for hemoconcentration, which might predispose, of course, to thromboembolism. Also, you have to check the C-reactive protein, which might give you an idea about the severity, the C-reactive protein, is one of the acute phase proteins, okay? And uh, of course, it's, its levels uh, uh, increase with the increase of the inflammatory response uh, in the body because we have a lot of inflammatory mediators. So this will increase the acute phase proteins, including the fibrinogen and C-reactive protein. And this can be a marker for the severity of the condition. There will be hypoosmolality Despite the, the hemo concentration, by the way, the serum concentration of some of the electrolytes, especially the sodium, will be low. There will be hyponatremia, and of course, hyponatremia uh, will be compensated by hyperkalemia. So there will be hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. There will be a uh, poor liver function test. So there will be elevated enzymes and reduced albumin. There will be a hypoalbuminemia and hypoproteinemia as well. Coagulation profile, of course, there will be increase in the fibrinogen and reduced antithrombin. So this increased the risk of thrombosis. Of course, you have to do the pregnancy test. You have to check the HCG uh, to check if the patient is uh, pregnant or not. Of course, you have to do the ultrasound scan and the ultrasound scan is fundamental also in categorizing the severity of the condition according to the ovarian size. And of course, if you're suspecting ovarian torsion, you have to do a, a Doppler velocimetry for the uh, ovarian vessels to check if there is blood flow to the ovary or not to uh, diagnose ovarian torsion. So one of the combinations which is found in ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is the elevated hematocrit value, hemoconcentration, associated with reduced osmolality because there is, you know, like a, um, a change in the... Uh, osmotic regulation inside the body. So the concentration of some electrolytes will be low despite the heme concentration and the low sodium level with reduced osmolality along with increase in the hematocrit is indicative of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So this is the these are the standard investigations. Some other investigations might be needed according to individualized basis. If there are complications or not, you might need to do arterial blood gases, D-dimers, ECG, echo, chest X-ray to diagnose pulmonary embolism by CT angio or the ventilation perfusion scan. These are other investigations that may be needed. Am I clear so far, everyone? 
Any questions so far? Okay. That's great. This is the ultrasound picture of the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. As you can see, the, 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 the massive follicular growth, of course. And as you can see in this picture here, these, by the way, are two ovaries. This is the right and left ovaries. They are, from their enlargement, they are nearly like uh, in close proximity to each other. Even we call this sign in the ultrasound, we call them kissing ovaries because they are uh, nearly attaching to each other because of the huge size of the ovary. So this is a, an ultrasound picture showing ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Also, according to the time of presentation, as I told you, we have two types. Early one, which is usually about seven days or within, I mean, one week after the HCG injection. And this is because of the excessive ovarian response. And one we call the late OHSS, which is typically presents 10 or more days after the HCG injection. And this is usually the result of endogenous HCG derived from an early pregnancy. And the late OHSS tends to be more prolonged and severe than the early form. Why? Because the endogenous HCG will be continuous along with pregnancy and start to rise more and more until reaching a plateau at 12 weeks gestation. So of course, the more the ovaries is exposed to endogenous HCG, the more prolonged and more severe the condition. So that's why we are too much worried and afraid of the late fall of OHSS. That's why if you have a case of OHSS, while you are doing ovarian stimulation of, uh, for a woman having IVA for exe, it's very important not to transfer the embryos in the same cycle. I mean, you have to stop the fresh embryo transfer, you have to freeze the embryos and wait until her condition resolves, then give her or transfer the frozen embryos. So this, or this is one of the uh, uh, you know, strategies now which have reduced the incidence of severe forms of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is the frozen embryo transfer. One of the things that, you know, saved a lot of lives because if you transfer the embryo freshly, this will cause uh, uh, pregnancy and the pregnancy, of course, will uh, uh, deteriorate the condition. But if you freeze the embryos, you will give the time for the ovaries to resolve the condition or the general condition of the patient to be well. And after one month, two months, you can transfer the frozen embryos. You can categorize the uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome into four types, mild, moderate, severe, and critical. And for each one, there are some features. Like the mild form, usually uh, the patient will have some a mild abdominal bloating and pain, and the ovarian size will be less than eight uh, uh, cubic uh, centimeter. And this is only the, the features you can see. So there are no other features, there are no other complications. This condition is uh, mild and there will be no problem in this issue. In the moderate form, there will be moderate pain associated with nausea and maybe vomiting there will be ultrasound evidence of a science, not clinical evidence, just ultrasound. Like you can see, mild free fluid, okay, in the uh, pelvis and the abdomen. And the ovarian size is usually between eight and 12. When we move to the severe form, then the patient will have clinical ascites, plus or minus hydrothorax. And there will be oliguria, increase in the hematocrit, more than 0.45, hyponatremia, hypoosmolality, hyperkalemia, hypoproteinemia, and the ovarian size is more than 12 centimeter cubic or cubic centimeter. When we move to the critical form, it's the same complications of the severe form plus tense ascites. Now the ascites is tense that the patient may not even have the ability to take her breath comfortably, okay? She cannot lie flat. 
and large hydrothorax, the hematocrit becomes more than 0.55. Also, the white blood cells become more than 25,000. There will be anuria, thromboembolism, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So in the critical forms, we can see complications. And this is and this form needs immediate admission to the hospital, even to the intensive care unit. Also, if you are working uh, uh, in the UK in uh, a fertility center, more the, the severe and critical forms of OHSS should uh, uh, be reported to what we call the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. This should be a verbal report within 12 working hours, then uh, followed by a completed incident form uh, within 24 working hours. So. Uh, if uh, and this may be a question in part two and part three uh, MRCG more than part one. I mean, they ask about you have, um, uh, where where to re or to report the cases of uh, severe or critical OHSS. This is uh, in uh, or to the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. Even in part three, uh, uh, there is a structured discussion about ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. The, the, the examiner asks you some questions about ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, and you have to mention in, in, in severe or critical cases, there should be reporting to this authority. If you don't mention that in the exam, this can affect your mark uh, uh, in the exam. So it's a very important point to consider. Now we will come to the last part, how to manage, how to manage the condition. Of course, if you are going to uh, manage an infertile patient and you are going to start ovulation induction for uh, IVF, for HC, or whatever you are doing in uh, for an infertile couple, okay, you have to uh, counsel the patient. You have to discuss with the patient, the uh, and give her verbal and written information about what is the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and. And this complication, it's not accepted at all that you give the treatment to the woman uh, without counseling her about the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, especially that if she is having high risk of this condition, like if she's uh, having a, a history of polycystic ovary syndrome, if she has, if she's having high reserve, if she's having uh, low PMI, young age, so on, you have to counsel the woman. And there should be a close liaison, a close communication between the fertility center and the emergency units who deal uh, or which deal with the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome cases. There should be a communication between the fertility center and the emergency units or the acute units dealing with such cases. Okay, so the management can be broadly classified into an outpatient management. And this is for the mild, moderate, and some selective cases of severe OHSS and the inpatient management. And the hospital admission should be considered in the following conditions. If the woman is uh, unable to achieve satisfactory pain control in the outpatient management, if she is unable to uh, um, maintain adequate fluid intake, because in outpatient, we are going to ask the patient to drink water okay, and drink, drink fluids. If she is having nausea and vomiting and she is in need of IV fluids, then you have to admit the patient. If she's having signs showing worsening of the condition, and I'm going to tell you what are these signs in a while, you have to admit the patient. If she is unable to have regular follow-up appointments, you have to admit the patient. And of course, if you have a critical or if the, the patient is having a critical OHSS, then you have to admit the patient, not only to the hospital, but it, she may need admission to the uh, intensive care unit. So to uh, make it easier to read the guidelines, these are the main uh, lines of management, whether in the outpatient or in the inpatient. Some lines are similar in the outpatient and inpatient, and some lines or some <clears throat> titles are different. What to do here or what to do there, okay? But the main items or the main topics are which healthcare team will be involved with in the management, what to monitor, 
the fluid balance and which I can I can say it's the cornerstone of the management of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome because the management in ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is supportive treatment. It's not like a curative treatment. We give something so the ovary will uh, be relieved from this exaggerated response. No, it's just a matter of wait and see. You support the condition and wait until the ovary resolve. Symptomatic treatment, I mean treatment of pain and also vomiting if present, thromboprophylaxis, another cornerstone, another important thing in the management of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and the paracentesis or aspiration of the acidic fluid. So this, these are the main items in the management. So if we talk about the healthcare team, and usually this is more with the inpatient management. I mean, in the outpatient management, there should be, of course, an, ex an experienced clinician who will deal with the woman uh, or with the women having OCCs. But in the inpatient management, usually there might be some other complications like oliguria, anuria, and uh, maybe uh, there is thromboembolism. There may be uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome. So all these uh, uh, complications need input from other specialties. So we can say it's a multidisciplinary team management. Uh, and also, as I told you, the critical cases of OHSS should prompt consideration of the need for intensive care. What to monitor? <clears throat> in the outpatient management, of course, you are not going to see the patient in daily basis. So you are going to give her the management outlines, the supportive treatment outlines, and you are going to review the patient every two to three days to check her condition and to see if there is any worsening of the condition or not. And in the majority of cases, the condition resolves within one week to 10 days, and the recovery is signaled by diuresis, by normalizing the hematocrit value, by reduction in the abdominal girth and body weight, because the resolving of the ascites will lead to reduction in the abdominal girth and, of course, in the body weight. So these are signs of uh, uh, how the condition is resolved. Can you hear my voice? Okay. Dr. Rahina, please check your internet connection. So you are listening to me clearly. The, was there any interruption? Okay, very well. So this is for the outpatient management. As, I, as we are going to review the patient every two to three days to check if there is any signs of uh, uh, worsening of the OHSS or not. But in the inpatient management, now you have to check the patient on daily basis. You have, on daily basis, you have to assess the body weight, the abdominal girth, fluid intake and output. We call that the fluid chart. And I told you, it's very important. If I'm going to uh, uh, start my shift in the hospital and uh, I'm going to have a case of OHSS, I myself, the, 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 the first question I ask about is the flow chart. What is What about the fluid intake and what is the, uh, about the fluid out? This is fundamental. This is very important. Full blood count on daily basis, hematocrit value, serum, electrolytes, and osmolality, liver function tests. And also, depending on the clinical features and the complications, we might add ABG, ECG, chest X-ray, as mentioned before, these complications these complicated, these, I mean, investigations should be done if we suspect some complications. So this is about the monitoring. So we are saying there, are, there might be some symptoms or uh, uh, signs which suggest worsening of the condition. What are these symptoms and signs? If the patient is having increased abdominal distension and pain, if the patient is having shortness of breath, tachycardia or hypotension, if the urine output is reduced less than one liter per day, or what we have what we call positive fluid balance. And what's meant by positive fluid balance? 
it means that the fluid out the fluid input is more than the output by about one liter i'm going i'm giving uh, uh, fluids to the patient but the, at the same time the urine output is very low that the difference between the output and uh, sorry between the input and the output is more than one liter or more than 1000 milliliter in one day of course and of course it's very uh, risky to give the uh, patient a lot of fluids and at the same time she is not uh, having good urine output because all the fluids you are giving it will be accumulated inside her body leading to <clears throat> increase in the ascites and can may may produce those also to uh, uh, pulmonary edema and that's very important uh, point to consider you have to balance between the input and the output also the increasing in the hematocrit value more than 0.45 is a sign of worsening or uh, uh, moving to a severe form of OHSS. <clears throat> so the hematocrit value is a very useful way to guide the degree of uh, <clears throat> hypovolemia and also the C-reactive protein. As I told you before, it's a very important marker to uh, check the severity of the condition. When we talk about the fluid Problems, which, as I told you, the cornerstone in the management. For the outpatient cases, you have to counsel the woman, give her a very important information that this fluid intake is very important and fundamental to her management. She should take at least one liter per day, and she should make some charts at her home. She should mark how many liters of fluid she took uh, in the day and how many times she went to the bathroom or the toilet in the day to make a balance between the input and the output charts. But in the inpatient management, here you have to do the uh, strict fluid balance charts by yourself. You can uh, ask the patient to take oral fluids guided by thirst, but if the patient is unable to maintain oral fluids, then you have to consider IV fluids and it's better to use the colloid solutions rather than the crystalloids. And uh, also you can use human albumin, especially if the patient is having hypoalbuminemia or hypoproteinemia. In some cases, you can get fluids, but at the same time, the oliguria is not resolving. It's the patient is still oliguric or anoric despite the IV fluids you are giving. Now, this, this problem might be because of the tense ascites. Sometimes the tense ascites, you know, uh, cause uh, um, high pressure on the renal blood vessels and the blood perfusion to the kidney is affected by the tense ascites. So if the oliguria is not responding to IV fluids, then you have to consider doing paracentesis or aspiration of the acetic fluid. This might improve the condition or this improve the condition in many cases. But if also the condition is not resolving with the IV fluids and also with paracentesis, at this point, you might consider giving diuretics. Generally, diuretics should be avoided because they will cause more hypovolemia. They are only considered when there is failure to improve the oliguria after IV fluids and also, and also after paracentesis or aspiration of the acetic fluid or drainage of the acetic fluid. For the symptomatic treatment, you can deal with the pain and vomiting by giving analgesics and antiemetics, but a point or a safety point, we call it, we call it a safety point. If you, if you, mention this uh, uh, point in uh, part three exam, especially you may success or fail in the safety domain, okay? Because you have to avoid the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You can prescribe only paracetamol or oral opiates. You have to avoid the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory because they might compromise the renal function more and more. And this might be a question, a single best answer question, which analgesic to be avoided 
in uh, dealing with a case of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, you have to avoid, of course, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Also, if you have severe pain, you might consider complications like torsion or rupture and, or uh, coincident ectopic pregnancy or pelvic infection. So as I told you before, severe pain is not a, is not a feature of standard cases of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So if you have severe pain, you have to search for other diagnoses. For thromboprophylaxis, whether you are dealing with a patient having, uh, which will be managed in an outpatient or an inpatient uh, way, you have to consider thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin. Of course, the dose and the time of the treatment will differ from one case to another according to other risk factors and whether the patient got pregnant or not, okay? Because if the patient got pregnant, uh, she should take low molecular weight heparin until the end of the first trimester. And this is a very important point. If the patient is having mild and moderate cases and no other risk factors, and she will be dealt with in an outpatient uh, way, you might prescribe either anti impulism stocking or low molecular weight heparin. But of course, uh, uh, this should be if you are going to choose between the anti impulism stocking or low molecular uh, or low molecular weight heparin. This, in cases of mild or moderate cases, what she says, she has no other risk factors, and you are you know uh, feeling comfortable that this patient is not at high risk of venous thromboembolism. At the end of the management, we have the paracentesis or the drainage of the acetic fluid. This can be done, of course, uh, uh, under ultrasound guidance by the abdominal or transvaginal routes. And of course, the indications of paracentesis include severe abdominal distension and abdominal pain. The patient is uh, having respiratory compromise. She is not able to take her breath comfortably and she is having shortness of breath. Oliguria not responding to IV fluids as mentioned before. All uh, are indications of paracentesis. And if you are going to drain the acetic fluid, you have to do a, a replacement by IV uh, colloid therapy if you are going to remove high volumes of the acetic fluid because uh, drainage of large amounts uh, uh, of uh, acetic fluid will cause sudden reduction in the intra-abdominal pressure and sudden reduction in the renal uh, 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 vascular uh, resistance, but sometimes this can might be associated with like uh, the sudden decrease in the intra-abdominal pressure might be associated with a little bit form of hypovolemia and hypoperfusion for the first instance because there was high pressure and then you relieve this pressure uh, uh, um, uh, at once. So you have to make a balance between what you drain and the IV, IV fluids you are giving to the patient. Is there a rule uh, for the surgical management in cases of OHSS if there are complications only? I mean, if the patient is having co-incidental problem like adnexal torsion or ovarian uh, uh, rupture or ectopic pregnancy, then you have to deal with that surgically, but you need a very expert surgeon because the ovary at this time is very vascular and of course uh, uh, the condition and the tissues is very friable, so you have to uh, these surgeries or these kinds of surgeries uh, might, must be dealt with by an experienced surgeon. In some cases, but these are very uh, uh, rare cases in which there is a progression of the thromboembolism, you might consider termination of pregnancy to decrease the risk of, or, uh, of uh, thromboembolism. But I have never seen in my practice, I have never seen a case who needs termination of pregnancy because of uh, thromboembolism. Uh, also, because of the marked inflammatory markers in the OHSS, this can affect the placentation, this can affect the blood vessels of the placenta, which may lead to uh, uh, preeclampsia or preterm pregnancy if uh, pregnancy occurs on top of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. The, the pregnancy might end by preterm delivery or by preeclampsia. So these are the main outlines of the management of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Of course, now in the, in the practice, there are many uh, uh, modalities of prevention of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, but this is uh, uh, somehow advanced point 
um, this is usually uh, even even it's not published in the green top guidelines it's published in those guidelines uh, related to the the fertility practice like the american uh, society of medical reproduction the asram or the ishri guidelines see it, uh, they talk about the, the giving metformin the insulin sensitizer giving the dopamine antagonist the drugs while giving stimulation because this might reduce the incidence of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Also, the uh, frozen embryo protocol have uh, limited the incidence of uh, severe and critical cases of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, before I end my session or my webinar, I'm just uh, uh, telling you that we have started our progressive course for part one. Uh, this is a, a comprehensive way for revision in one month for those taking the exam in January. We divided the subjects into bundles, and in each bundle, we give you access to important materials and recordings. Then we have one live session for revising the most important questions in these topics. Then you have access uh, to topic tests on our website. You can uh, uh, practice yourself, practice and test yourself. And also at the end of the uh, uh, course, there will be a very uh, uh, comprehensive workshop in which you are going to answer like 1,000 plus questions for the exam, especially those from the uh, last uh, uh, or past papers. So if you want to join this progressive course, you can, of course, contact our team in Media Exam Expert. Of course, it will be our pleasure to have you with us in this uh, progressive course. Um, by this, we come to the end of our uh, uh, free webinar. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and got the maximum benefit. If you have any feedback or comment or any question, I would be happy to listen and answer yours. Yes, Dr. Saima, you can ask. <clears throat> Sir, I want to know, as you have described, it is beta SCG, which is the main reason for ovarian hyperstimulation. But, sir, for ovulation induction I'm, drug... I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I think your voice is very far. I, don't, I, I can't hear your voice very well. I don't know why. Can, you, sir, can you repeat the question? Sir, now my voice is clear? Yes. Sir, as you have told that beta SCG is the main drug which causes ovarian hyperstimulation. Yes. Then why we say letrozole is more safe uh, as compared to clomiphen for ovulation induction in the form of OHSS? Why letrozole is? is safe. No, no. Uh, yes. No, no. The, the letrozole, yes. The letrozole they found that the uh, and letrozole and clomiphene, as I told you, usually uh, are usually used in those mild forms of uh, induction of ovulation. Like if you are having a patient is having PCO, okay, she has a problem with her ovulation and her cycles. So you are going to give her like uh, clomiphene citrate, letrozole, and timed intercourse or uh, or maximum as like intrauterine insemination. She is not having uh, ART, okay. So the letrozole was found to have like uh, it's not like the uh, better better than clomiphen citrate in OHSS alone, they found that the letrozole induced monofollicular growth better than the clomiphen citrate. I mean that the incidence of multifollicular growth with clomiphen citrate is more than letrozole. So letrozole is better in cases of PCO because it induced monofollicular growth. So it reduced the incidence of hyperstimulation and also reduced the incidence of multiple pregnancy. Okay. And it's not the same when you trigger HCG on one follicle and you trigger HCG on two or three follicles, okay? There is a, there is a great, great difference, okay? Yes, the HCG is the main reason, okay? But it's not the same response when you trigger the HCG on one follicle and when you give the HCG trigger on two or three follicles. And even if you do a mild stimulation for uh, uh, PCO, and you have three or more follicles in the ovary, you have to cancel the cycle. You have to tell the patient, 
to avoid any intercourse in this cycle. And we are going to repeat the ovulation induction in another cycle because if she got pregnant on these three or four follicles, uh, she might uh, uh, have ovary, late ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, okay? <clears throat> Here, Dr. Simon? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, well. Okay, Dr. Ofe is asking to explain the two protocols once more. Okay, quickly, quickly. I, the idea uh, like, let me um, the idea, Dr. Ofe, is like if we um, if we are doing controlled ovarian stimulation, okay, if you are doing controlled uh, ovarian stimulation, and this is for a patient is having IVF or ICSI, we are doing or giving doses of gonadotropines to have multiple follicular growth, like I told you from eight to 15 oocytes. The problem is that I want to pick up these oocytes in the, in the lab under ultrasound guidance. So, I have to find a way to shut down the pituitary gland, okay? I have to shut down the pituitary gland to avoid the endogenous LH surge. How to shut down the pituitary gland? Either to give a general H agonist drug, but in a continuous way for long periods, okay? This will cause down regulation of the receptors or to give GNRH antagonist drug this will cause immediate blocking of the pituitary receptors and suppress the pituitary gland. And after the follicle reach the desired size, the size of maturation, I induce or trigger the ovulation by giving HCG injections, which will work as uh, or do the same function of the endogenous LH surge. The thing I said that if we have, or if we have GNRH agonist protocol, I have only one option to trigger the ovulation, which is the HCG injection. But if I, if I am using the GNRH antagonist protocol, then I have two options, whether to use the HCG or the GNRH agonist. I give single shot of GNRH agonist, which will stimulate the endogenous LH surge. That's the good thing about the antagonist, that in using the antagonist protocol, I can use the GNRH agonist trigger and avoid the use of HCG, which is the main reason behind ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Clear? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Any more questions? Okay, thank you so much again, everyone, for joining me in this uh, webinar. I really enjoyed uh, your attendance, and I hope you enjoyed the information in the session. Uh, inshallah, the, the recording of this uh, webinar will be available on our uh, YouTube channel, uh, maybe tomorrow, I think. So uh, you can listen uh, to this webinar again uh, whenever you need on our YouTube channel. Again, thank you so much. I wish you all the best of luck and see you in more in more webinars uh, soon inshallah bye bye